going to go ahead and start with our regular council meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order, and I guess we'll all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance again. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll do the roll call again, please, Molly. Yep. Alderperson Henry. Here. Alderperson Schaefer. Here. Alderperson Valley. Here. Alderperson Dean. Here. Alderperson Rimmer. Here. Alderperson Price. Here. Alderperson Iker. Here. Mayor Atwell. Present. Administrator Hafner. Here. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to four public hearing. A public hearing number one topic amend 7 4 City of Delafield 2030 Master Land Use Plan Map. Location DELC 0792074439 St. John's Road DELC 0792069 and DELC 0792078411 St. John's Road and DELC 0792073 and DELC 0792060 unknown address on Wisconsin Avenue and St. John's Road. Owner Hendricks Commercial Properties LLC, City of Delafield. Matter, uh, amend map 7-4, City of Delafield 2030 Master Land Use Plan map from the institutional category to the medium density residential category. Is there anyone that would like to speak to public hearing number one? Anyone that would like to speak to public hearing number one? Seeing num none, public hearing number one is now closed. Move on to item number five, approval of minutes of October 3rd, 2022 regular meeting. Move to approve the minutes from October 3rd. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions passes. All right, number six, City of Delafield citizens' comments. Any topic you'd like to talk about, now's the time to come on up. Any citizens' comments, come on up. Read it. I can't read it. <laughs> Susie Thompson, 700 Milwaukee Street. While we're talking about development and we're talking about traffic, and there was a traffic study in tonight's uh, plan, and it was done, I believe, the beginning of August. Um, something happened last Friday that I wanted to make a note of. It was absolutely shocking to my husband and, and myself but we live in milwaukee and oneida as most of you know there was a school bus going eastbound on milwaukee street stopped near angelina's had the light the arm out and the lights flashing two children got off to cross the street and a car came from the area of milwaukee and genesee and zoomed around luckily the bus driver blew the horn and told the children to stop they almost got hit. We were so speechless. Um, by the time we could call 911, that car was gone. We knew it was a little red four-door with what appeared to be high school kids in it. Um, the children, the parents had gotten, the bus was gone. But this happens all over town. Um, and I know uh, off of Highway 83, a lot of people have talked about the traffic problem on Nagawica. Um, and in other areas. What was discussed, separate uh, subject, but what was discussed about the building of commercial buildings along 83, I think it's been repeatedly said people don't want to see that. And instead of 30 to 50,000 to talk about 100 to 250,000 are massive, and what first came to my mind is, okay, it's going to rain. Where's the water going? We worry about residential, where's the water going in the drainage? Um, but I think from an aesthetic point of view, having been a real estate broker when Brickfield, Barker Road, and Industrial Drive developed, and some beautiful businesses that are now beautifully landscaped, if you've ever been to the Humane Society, it's in that area, um, those buildings are not 100,000, they're smaller, and, and it is a loop that goes in and out. But it was a problem. Anybody ho owning residential homes in the early 90s across the street from that development. 
So when people say we don't want the noise and, and we talk about how many trucks and how many in and outs and car doors slamming from employees, it would be a direct impact. I'd like to see what the city has to say about medium and low density housing for that area. And if you put something else along 83, but I don't think we need to pack in industrial there. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, is there anyone else that would like to make citizens comment? Come on up. Hello. Uh, I'm Kathy Patassen, and I live in St. John subdivision. Um, Can you please provide what? your exact address hmm? and your spelling of your last name, please? P-T-A-C-I-N. And then your exact address. My what? Address. Your, 708 St. John's Drive. Thank you. Okay, hearing number one went by so fast, I didn't even... You're good. Okay, <laughs> uh, real quick. Um, number one, there's almost 100 acres for sale currently just south of 94. We all talked about huge industry and all this coming to the Delafield. Isn't that a potential site for some bigger buildings if that's what Delafield needs? I don't know. Number two... Um, I tried to read through the traffic study that was listed on the agenda. Um, I don't know, how can you do a traffic study if you don't even know what the volume and density is going to be for that high-density high density area where the post office is? I don't understand that. Um, so the, I guess I'm just worried how we're going to make a left turn. Right now, we can't even get out of our subdivision. And there's a lot of questions, and it seems like every time I come to one of these meetings, something new is being presented that's just unbelievable. So that's all i got to say. I trust that you'll keep residents in mind that are in our little subdivision. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your comments. I saw another hand back there. Come on up, please. Sure, sure. Um, Hand it out. We'll pass it around and share if we need to. Thank you. Um, what I'm handing out is just um, one of your favorite weddings done. Um, Sue Jurgensen, 403 Wisconsin Avenue. Um, what I handed out is an average wedding out where they park uh, and use that St. John's. I'm sorry, can church. you speak into the mic? Which park? Oh, the church that is. Just south of like Wisconsin Avenue, off was at St. John's. I've lived here ten years. I should know this stuff. I'm sorry, but the church, you know, is used for weddings and everything else, and they park solidly along St. John's Drive. They also park down Smythe, and I don't really care. I mean, they have to park somewhere, and with the housing that's going in, it's very concerning. It's like where are they going to actually park? Um, I'm not opposed to, obviously, people and everything moving in, but I think we, we need to work with St. John's. Um, this is going to be rude, but everyone talks about wanting to save St. John's, and it is a pivotal in our society, in our community. I really feel they put us on the map. I mean, they made the namesake. Where do you live? Delafield. Well, where's that? Oh, St. John's. Everyone knows St. John's. I mean, so, I mean, that is my concern because it just appears to me that every square inch is being developed and I'm not opposed to development but I have concerns on the school and their success because of who they are what they represent I mean I am infuriated that Smythe House is being removed and that is the founder of St. John so I find it as someone who likes history and into that that to me it's just, if that's the one house that can be saved, I mean, most places when they uh, build and grow, they don't necessarily tear down everything. Um, the other big concern is when you're adding volume to an area, you should not be taking away crossroads. It, public safety, fire, rescue, everything, when you have to go around thing. I had a major gas leak at my house, and everyone was cut off from going anywhere, and this is about a dozen years ago when I bought it. It's like, where are we all going to file through if we have to get around? I mean, it's a logical concern of us living there. So 
those are my big concerns. I am concerned still with St. John's. I mean, it's been around for 100 years, and if something goes wrong, that place can go down and it can be gone. And that's part of our history that it might not matter to, you know, for our society, but in the future. So I really hope that I don't fall on deaf ears when I say this. And my voice is shaking because I'm just trying to stay calm over an area that I frigging love. And I want to keep it that way. And I want to always stay proud of living in Delafield and not turn into West Allis or Burbs or what Oconomowoc has turned into. I mean, we've all heard it. You know, they're just not happy there. We have such a quality of life. And I would like to just kind of keep that and have trees. Let's really push the developer not to get rid of every single tree, not have sidewalks where they'll take out the whole row of everything. So I just want you guys to consider that. I mean, I know I'm a small little bug on the planet, but just, just think about it, please, is all I ask. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you for your comments. Thank Appreciate you. your comment. Thank you. Who else would like to do citizens' comments? Anyone else? Come on up. Um, Peggy Matt Seward, 2520 Nagawick Road, and it's M A T hyphen. Okay. I just, it was a surprise visit, or visit, notice that I got that you guys were having a meeting about this tonight. And I just want to reiterate thank you, Danielle and Mark, for speaking about, uh, speaking up for the residents in that area where the industrial park is supposedly going in. Um, I just want to reiterate that I hope the city of Delafield remembers all the residents. And the reason why we moved here is the, the look and the space that we all bought in here to live, you know, in harmony and stuff, instead of having these light pollution with industry and more roads and traffic. And I just wanted to voice that as a concern for all of us that moved out here. And I've been out in the city of Delafield and the town of Delafield for over 30 years. And that's, I just hope we don't turn into an Oconomowoc, Pewaukee. We won't. Pardon? We won't. Uh, I don't know. With looking at that stuff, it's super scary. We're good I just, pictures. I know, but surprises have happened. And sure. we all know that. But thank you very much. And even though we might think we're a bug, it takes many ants to move a mountain. So don't give up. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. Anybody else? Come on up. I apologize. I tried to get up here, but got shut down pretty quickly on the St. John's. Can I make comments on this? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Chris Miller with Miller Marriott Construction. Um, I'm going to reiterate some of the same points I made at the Planning Commission meeting and um, I do appreciate the comments of the community, um, you know, reflecting on the comments that have been made, even just watching the presentation as I came in here, I think it's um, uh, refreshing to see uh, the back and forth in the community. Um, I'm supportive of, supportive of the medium density. I think it gives uh, the residents of the North uh, assurances that will match similar density to them. Um, you know, again, I'm going to reiterate from the last meeting, traffic studies are meant to be studies on how the development will affect traffic. Many of the traffic concerns are from vehicles coming from outside the community. So I think everybody should kind of keep that in mind as we do these traffic studies and they get presented. We also have presented a, um, a well study um, from a hydrologist as well, um, basically saying that uh, the wells, even if you include the golf course of 50 lots, would not be a measurable dis uh, uh, um, measurable uh, drop in water uh, from that aquifer. So um, I want to just point those out. Um, I think the trees are important. We've already done a tree study on the property. The intent is to keep as many as we can. Um, I like trees. I think they make the property more valuable. So thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else like to speak during citizens' comments? All righty. End of citizens' comments. We'll move on to number seven, special order of business. Brief presentation and summary of proposals by E. 
each solid waste and recycling collection uh, contractor. Um, basically, I'm going to ask each contractor, as uh, Tom had asked before the meeting, to you know, keep your presentation to about five minutes. Um, then the council will have an opportunity to ask some questions about your proposal, and then we'll move on to the, the next company. So the first one I have here on the list is uh, GFL, if you could come up, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Johnson. I'm the area government contract manager for GFL. And I uh, want to first off say thank you for the opportunity to put a proposal in for the city. Um, had a lot of, of dialogue with Tom. Um, and just to give a little bit of background, um, GFL, it, it, we're new to the area, but our management team is not new to the area. Um, the way GFL came to be is after the purchase of Advanced Disposal, where myself and the rest of our management team uh, was employed and, and picking up the garbage for uh, the good folks of, of the city of Delafield. Uh, when waste management purchased advanced disposal, um, in order for them to close on that per, uh, purchase and to avoid any types of a monopoly, um, they had to, to divest a number of assets, and GFL purchased those assets. So that's how myself and, and um, a lot of the managers ended up at GFL. So um, we're very familiar with what the residents here expect in terms of services. Uh, when we were with Advanced Disposal, some of you that lived here long enough remember when we were called Veolia, you remember when we were called Superior, so we've had a lot of name changes. I've got a lot of, a lot of different shirts in my closet. Um, I've been with the company for 20 years, but what it really boils down to is our, our team knows what you guys expect and, and frankly what you deserve in terms of quality services. I know um, about two years ago when waste management took over, things didn't go as great as many of folks probably had hoped. Um, and it's created a real great opportunity for our company and our expertise. Uh, we, back in January, um, we took over the contract in the town of Delafield, uh, the city of Brookfield, and, and a few others. and. I would urge you, maybe you already have spoke to some of those references, but they are very happy that our team is back. Are we perfect? No, but we're pretty close. And when there are issues, you actually know who you can get a hold of. Um, the response is very good. Um, one theme I've heard tonight is quality of life when it comes to planning, when it comes to a lot of these things. And I know with these garbage proposals, there's a couple different options out there. But one that we have the experience in, we have experience in all of it, but is our up the drive service. Um, the town of Delafield was very close to switching to automated services about this time last year. And uh, they ended up having to call basically an emergency meeting at a two o'clock on a Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember, and it was packed. Um, the folks there, basically the, the attitude was, we moved here, we wanted this quality of life, and I kind of underplayed it uh, in a lot over the years of how important up the drive services was, but those folks did not want to lose that service. Um, they were willing to pay for it, they wanted to keep that. Um, so when I, I hear through talking about the development, um, we're the experts at it. We, we've been doing it for many years. We were doing services here for 20 plus years, like I said, under various names, but really the same management teams. A um, couple different people, but then we brought others up through the ranks. So um, we would really like that opportunity to come back, show you guys uh, the services that we can deliver. Um, Tom himself lives in the city of Brookfield where we took over, and I, I think he would give us pretty high marks in terms of the transition there. Um, and and it, you know, there's always going to be some hiccups, I'm not gonna lie, but um, we managed through those and, and got the city of Brookfield cleaned up quite quickly. Um, one of the big things that we also wanna stress is our local customer service. When we were advanced disposal, we did get away from that model, um, and it did not go well. 
One of the commitments that GFL has made is that we are going to keep our customer service local. So we're just located up the street in the, in the village of Heartland. Um, so we'll have our call, call center there. It's already there, um, servicing the folks in Brookfield and other communities that, that we've taken over in. And um, we've also added, uh, as a further value added service, when you think of the bulk pickup, some, of the, some folks just have to get rid of that recliner. They can't wait for the next pickup. Um, we're also putting our transfer station available to residents within the city of Delafield where they can come to the, the transfer station and use that free of charge for any bulk items that they just can't wait to get rid of if they can get it over there. Usually someone has a pickup truck or something that they can help out with it on that. But um, again, uh, we just appreciate the opportunity. We would really be happy if we could be partners again and, and work with Tom and the staff here and deliver the services that the good folks here deserve and expect. Thanks. Thank you. Yep, so I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so basically, if I'm understanding this correctly, you, for your base bid, um, you're offering automated, automated service for everyone. But where you can't turn around a, a, a big commercial garbage truck is, is garbage pickup at the streets included in that bid or does the, the people on the dead ends or wherever you can't turn around do they have to pay the two hundred dollars is that okay um it's a good question um so we gave two proposals one is what we would call our curbside proposal it may or may not be automated uh so we broke down a map um and again it's based on our 20 some years of experience of knowing Oh, we can't go down, you know, just some of the ones that I remember from times I was out there. Key Point Lane, it's really not accessible with a large commercial uh, automated truck. Bark River Road and, and where Lance Drive pulls off of that. Blue Spruce, Milwaukee Street, especially like 1st and 2nd Street in those spots. You really can't get what you would call an automated garbage truck down those. So in those areas, uh, we would offer the pickup truck service. So similar to what you have now, but it would be roadside. Uh, so we would come through with that style of, of collection truck and pick those folks up. Now, in the areas- At the end of their drive. At the end of their driveway, correct, roadside. Um, in the areas where we, it's pickup truck service, we would offer those residents up the drive services. Um, there, there would be the annual fee of $200, and that would be identical to the service that you have now. Um, and you bill those homeowners that we would bill, directly? We would bill those homeowners directly, and we'd continue that billing on an annual basis uh, until they wanted to discontinue it, but we would go up the drive. For the areas where we can access those homes uh, with our full-size automated trucks, those folks would not have the opportunity to continue with up the drive service. And um, that's when your second proposal comes in. And that's place. where the second proposal would be just to stay the, the, the status quo of services where everybody gets up the drive. We would service it with the pickup trucks um, and we would continue it that way. Okay. Um, when we had first met, uh, we were reluctant to provide an automated or a roadside, I gotta get away from automated, a roadside proposal because of our experience. But just knowing that, you know, you would probably like to see the comparison. Um, we, we wanted to put something together, so we got our guys back out and put our memory caps on and started driving back out through the neighborhood and checking it out where, we knew we could where we couldn't um if anything had changed in the last two years really not not much has but um that that's how we built our two proposals great thank you yep any other questions all right thank you very much thank you thank you all right if we could have john's come up next please
Good evening. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Dan Youngiches. Um, Can you spell uh, your last name, please? Yes, I will. It's a difficult one. It's J O N G E T J E S. Thank you. Many asked me that question. Um, so, John's Disposal, we're a family owned and operated business. John's actually my grandfather, so I'm third generation at John's. Um, and we just want to say thanks for the opportunity to submit a proposal uh, to your city. Uh, just like GFL, uh, we proposed uh, multiple options for the city to consider as well. So we proposed uh, the up the drive collection, uh, where we are also fairly familiar. We're a bit newer to the area. We've provided up the drive service in the village of Elm Grove for the past seven years. Uh, also the village of River Hills. And then recently we just started up the drive service in the town of Brookfield. Uh, so we are fairly familiar with the up the drive service. Um, additionally, we did also provide uh, a, a quote for roadside or the automated collection with carts. Um, I think one thing that's very unique about our proposal, maybe considered to the rest, is if the city does choose to switch to the automated collection, we would offer any resident to subscribe to the up the drive collection service. So if a resident just says we don't want the big carts, um, they would just we would we would roll it out where they could call us and they could be a subscriber for that service and we offer that service in nearby somewhat nearby communities we just rolled that out in the city of New Berlin and we also offer that in the city of Pewaukee and the city of Oconomowoc as well so that's one thing to consider that's a bit unique about our service um, we also offered a bulk items collection so that would be uh, residents can call us and they are allowed two collections per month. So that's up to 24 uh, calls per year. So if some people have a lot of stuff to get rid of, they would just call us and we'll come collect it. And that, that we quoted, it's all broken down in our proposal, but that's $2.05 a month and that is optional. So we do have some communities that don't subscribe to a bulk items collection and then we would offer residents to call us it would be at a premium if we're not offering it you know as part of your citywide program and that was $95 like per collection is our going rate in 2022 we don't encourage it we highly recommend going with the monthly program for bulk um, we also have our call center we have three locations and our call center is local also we're in the city of Whitewater um, and uh, we we um what else do i want to highlight we also have some premium services that we would include that you could consider and those are fairly well spelled out and tom did a really nice job of outlining some of those premium services but um being a family business we do really try to promote our high level of service and so one example is is that we'll even uh allow residents to subscribe for like we call it walk-up service so our driver literally will get out and walk all the way up their drive, the resident's driveway, roll the cart down for the resident. They'll dump the cart and then roll it all the way back up. That would be as if the city chose to switch to the roadside service. And it gives my drivers a little bit of exercise that they need as well. Um, with the up the drive service, there's some other premiums that we include as well, and we're fairly familiar with it. Um, as far as something even like in the garage service and we're fairly familiar with that that kind of service that we provide um, Also in the village of Shaniqua and in River Hills and then in Elm Grove as well So those are some things that we're very familiar with with the up the drive service um, Last but not least I would um, just encourage you I think it's in your packet that's put together tonight is to just glance at our appendix B which is all of our references and um, again, thank you for the opportunity. We feel as a family owned and operated business, we can provide a really personal high level of service. And um, what was mentioned earlier, earlier this evening, we are one of those unique third generation family businesses that we feel can provide a really personal high level of service. So that's what I have for you tonight. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. I, I have ask? a question? Yeah, I do. Yes. <laughs> so I'm trying to get my, my head around bulk is the yeah. question I have for you. And I guess what is typical bulk? What are examples? And then what might be things that people might not know are bulk, but actually are bulk? And then 
are there abusers of bulk? Do you have some residents that just seem to have excessive amounts of bulk for whatever the reasons may be? I'm just trying to understand this bulk. Uh, bulk is a, it's a, it's an interesting animal that we wrestle with often. The answer to your question is, uh, Yes, people probably are confused by it, and bulk um, should have parameters because it does get abused. And so we work to try to define that, and there are residents that sometimes struggle with it. And so what we really appreciate with our call-in bulk program is that we're able to uh, identify maybe violators or something of that sort, and what my drivers will take a picture and they'll essentially call it into my office and um, say, hey, this is a pretty excessive pile. And so um, we will take it. And then when that resident calls us again, the customer service rep will see, uh, ooh, we had a note from the driver. And they'll have a discussion with the resident to talk about the excessive pile that they put out last month and work on some of the parameters for bulk. So. Bulk is, um, it's definitely important. It's, I think all the more if you would transition to the roadside with the cart program, because then it's really contained to what can fit inside of their cart. And so, you know, a, call, a, a couch, a recliner, a sofa, kitchen table, and chairs, those are all items that would qualify as like a bulk items collection. So, so bulk is, it is in a bit of a hot topic, but I mean, we've, we've quoted you here, um, 24 bulk collections a year. They just have to call our office and then we'll, they'll get them on the schedule and we send a separate truck into the city to come through and collect all of the bulk items. And one thing I didn't mention, but our bulk does include twice per year residents can substitute their bulk for an electronic item. So um, we keep track of that, and they can say, "I got a TV. I want to get rid of." That would be. They can do that twice a year as well. Does that somewhat yeah. answer the question? So, like a we small window air conditioner is that bulk? Yeah, that. So that'd be right, like a Freon appliance, and that would be included as well. Our trucks are separate. Like I said, it's a separate truck that comes. Even a refrigerator would be included as a bulk item. Yeah. Yes. But, so for roadside service, anything that basically doesn't fit in the can is bulk that yes yep. now one other thing to note for the roadside service so that would be a pretty significant change for your city i mean you guys are used to the up the drive program there's significant savings as well um the the one other thing we would in, that that is included is is that we would offer additional carts to your residents. So if somebody says this ninety five gallon cart just isn't going to cut it for my family, I got five kids, it's not going to work. They can subscribe with Johns for additional carts, and then they would pay Johns once a year to have an additional cart at their home if if they feel they need additional carts. And then on the contrary, other people will say. That thing is way too big. It's not going to work for me. We have one uh, cart we offer that's half the size. It's 48 gallons. And we will exchange the large carts for the small carts at no additional cost to the resident. So a lot of the, the older folks that say, hey, it's just me and my wife. I got one bag of trash. That thing's way too big. Um, it's almost like a Merry Christmas to them when we're rolling them out in December and we give them the smaller cart and then everybody's happy. I, I miss one other thing I should tell you that is unique about our proposal. We also uh, quoted weekly recycle collection if you would choose to go with the curbside automated collection. We're finding more and more communities are switching to weekly collection for recycling. That would be another unique thing that changes is that right now you have weekly collection for both garbage and recycling. So if you would go with the, the curbside or the roadside service with the carts, we're just including weekly recycle collection. So that, that's an additional 26 collections a year. And residents don't have to try to know what's their week for recycling. Um, how do you address like the narrow roads and the... the yeah, so for Johns, how would we address the narrow roads? Um, I haven't been looking your direction, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, we serve a lot of communities that have challenges as well. One that came to my mind was over um, the Lake Geneva area. It's actually called Lynn Township. So we would assess those challenging roads as well. 
and all the roads that would be a problem for us to get our large truck down, we would send a smaller, what we call the up the drive truck, and on those roads as well to serve those residents. And we would we would need it to be roadside as well. Um, but we have the smaller trucks to serve those challenging areas as well. Okay, thank you. The, the um, optional items like uh, optional yard waste collection, is that a decision, is that all or nothing for the city or is that on an individual level? Yeah, so yard waste is yet another interesting thing that we quoted you, so it's like a quite a large a la carte thing that we wanted to give you. Yard waste would be, um, it's it would be citywide and residents would have to call us to, to receive a cart for yard waste, but it would be a citywide program and it and it's not it's not per resident. Okay. Am I am I explaining that correctly enough, Tom, or should I clarify? Well, the, city, the city would get charged per resident, even if only a third of the residents use it. Yeah. That's okay. the basis of your pricing model. That's exactly right. There's there's a bit of a, we're a, maybe you'd say kind of just we're we're predicting how many are going to use it, and that's the price point that we chose for the city. Regardless if everyone in the city uses it or only a third use it. Got it. That would be the rate we need for the yard waste program. Thanks. Is that a service that you could do like a couple of times a year? Like if you did like, you know, for a month in the fall and a month in the spring as people are doing their... We, we yes, we, we, we didn't quote it, but we provide that in many other municipalities that we serve. We just, this is the city of Franklin Yard Waste Week where we are, you know, collecting the whole city. And I think Franklin does about six or eight collections a year, some are in the spring and some are in the fall. So that would, we didn't quote it, but if we, you know, if you guys chose to go with John's, that's something that we could negotiate okay. with the city to Thank just you. provide a few. So on yard waste, what I'm familiar with is you go to Menards or Home Depot and you buy these brown bags. Is that the type of process you're talking about? So if it, your yard waste doesn't fit in the brown bags, it's... It's not what we quoted. So okay. we quoted to actually provide a third large container. Okay. What, what um, Danielle is asking about would be the brown bag program. We'd have to negotiate that later. In our proposal, it was for a rollout 95-gallon cart, and that's what they'd be limited to. But we would provide that service. I think we said we'd provide it April through November, and that we would come weekly to collect the yard waste. And what's it, typically in there? Leaves, sticks? A lot, of, a lot of people bag their grass, too. So grass. when the grass is growing in the summer, they put their They're grass cutting. in there. We like to mulch our grass, um, and they could put leaves in there, and then when they're cutting their perennials, and basically what we tell people is anything that grows in their in their yard, not dirt, and not wood chips, <laughs> uh, Dan, or do garbage. They, do they have to bag the material before putting it in the no, cart? They can, no, they put it, it the loose cart. in the cart. Yeah. It would go loose in the cart. Do they keep the cans all year? They, they would keep the can all year, okay. yes. It would be a 95-gallon rolled automated collected cart. Thank you. It'd take you all year to get rid of your leaves in a <laughs> typical house in Delafield with that. <laughs> It's a, it It'd was be composted we, by the time we got to the end. It's something we threw in there. I think that is uh, kind of fairly low on the totem pole here of you know what, what you guys are kind of up against for at least the garbage and recycle collection. Well, great. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks thank for you. your uh, thank the opportunity. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, LRS Badger Land Disposal is up next. Hi, Susan Melmanger, Badgerland. Oh, I know you're going to say that. M A L M A N G E R. Thanks so much. It's nice to meet you all. Thank you for this opportunity. I think Tom threw us in the mix for a bare bones opportunity here. <laughs> Badgerland Disposal started in Milton five, six years ago. Um, we were acquired by LRS, which is based in Chicago, so they basically back us. 
They're trying to rebrand. Everybody knows Badgerland. We've been around. Um, we're moving this way, meaning that we opened a shop, um, a service place with a few reps there now and about 12 trucks in New Berlin. We're newer to the area. Um, we started servicing the village of Waukesha this year, and the village of Sussex will be starting in 2023. We did not offer you up the drive. So what I've given you guys is just a thought of if you are not going to give that, um, kind of what that looks like without all the perks. With that said, everything operationally that these guys have talked about, real standard across the industry, okay? My managers were all from advanced disposal. They also know your community. They know how to service your community. Any roads that can't get down with a big truck, they do have a satellite truck. They're just not willing to offer up the drive where someone can call and pay for it separate. Okay, with that said, there is walk-up service if someone has a disability or is physically unable to get their cart to the curb. So we do that for um, a handful of residents in all the communities that we serve. Just wanted to let you know like where we are, um, who we are, um, that we're growing this way, um, but we're kind of new. And what we're offering is a little more limited. Um, I shouldn't say that because it's really just the up the drive that, that is not um, on the price sheet. So kind of interesting. Um, what else did I want to tell you? I think really they've kind of touched on all the, the nitty stuff. I did give you an option for weekly or every other week recycle, um, and then an option to include an additional cost per home every month so that everyone would have two bulk items included per month. And the bulk rules are the same across, across the industry. You have to call them in. I don't know how long have you guys had a chance to look at the proposal. If you have any questions for me or our team, you know, or who we are or what we are, um, please let me know. It, it might be in here, but what do you charge for a bulk pickup? If you want to include it with your no, program. No, just if, somebody, if a homeowner called and asked for yep, it. Yep, so it's either $50 or $60. A basic okay. bulk item or non-free on appliances are 50 and then free on appliances are 60 Okay. If you didn't want to give them any bulk option, just pay as you go. All right, any questions? All right, Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, we have our waste management. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tony Kinect. I'm the public sector manager in this area for waste management. Into the mic, please. Oh, your last name. Yeah. Am I a little too far away? No, you need to, yeah, you need to be closer. Am I good now? Good. All right. Thanks for the thumbs up. Uh, my name is Tony Kinnick. I uh, work for you, Waste Management. Can you spell that, please? The last sure. K-N-O-E-C-K. -E Thank you. I've uh, been working with Waste Management or for Waste Management for the last 13 years uh, now. Um, obviously, you all know we acquired Advanced Disposal about two years ago. On about two weeks, it'll be two years ago. Uh, with that came a lot of challenges. Um, as you were probably aware of when we first started, we had to overcome a lot of obstacles. Um, things from equipment that we received, uh, which was not maintained, was not in working order. Uh, a lot of things had to be fixed. Uh, staffing challenges where we expected people to come over in that acquisition and they didn't, so we had to fill those roles. Uh, we've been working tirelessly since then, uh, have turned that around in our Heartland Hauling office. Um, they've done a very good job uh, over the past year and a half of fixing and improving those things to a point of uh, we have been servicing municipalities on a, a level uh, that we're used to uh, now, uh, which is a good thing. Um, Again, uh, I know there were struggles. I know there were concerns at the beginning. Uh, but again, the bright side is we saw the light at the end of the tunnel. We did the things that we needed to do to fix those things, um, those concerns. And uh, we are, we're back in a good place again. Uh, we've been in Wisconsin uh, doing business as waste management since 1959. Uh, we have not been bought or acquired. Um, we, we usually make good business decisions, and there's a reason why. Uh, you guys have all the proposals in front of you. Tom did a great job of uh, providing not only a summary, but passing on the full proposals. Uh, so I don't have much to add, uh, obviously, with three different companies talking before me that kind of went through the ins and outs of uh, what's curbside service. Obviously, that's carted. 
uh, wheeled carts with lids on them, 96 gallon size. Usually there are other sizes uh, that we can offer, uh, but that uh, is usually the most efficient, effective way to service communities nowadays. Uh, majority of communities are done that way. Uh, and obviously with the smaller lakeside roads and things like that, we do uh, have those challenges in other areas. Uh, and we do have uh, specific vehicles that go down those roads, uh, pickup trucks, just like we use now for up the drive. Uh, so with that curbside uh, program, uh, as you can see on here, uh, 96 or 64 gallon carts uh, for drill, both trash and recycling. Uh, additional carts uh, can be gotten by a resident if they do do need one do want one they can they can rent it uh de depending on if it's a trash or recycling cart on a monthly basis or they can pay an annual uh, fee and yeah, they can have additional carts if they need to uh, we also have hardship walk-up service which is where a resident wouldn't be able to physically uh, wheel their cart down from their driveway uh, down to the curbside road we we have our drivers get out get those bring them down empty them take them back up to the garage again and what's the verification process for that typically the resident usually contacts the municipality and just lets them know hey it, it, i'm having a lot of difficulty i've got a long driveway whatever it might be and, and the municipality just informs us and they they usually will tell us hey you know, one two three main street do you ask for any documentation from the municipality or some do uh some do because they and it's not of our we're not asking them we're not requesting that we're taking the municipality's word for it but some municipalities actually do request that uh, what would be resident. typical uh, just the doctor's note saying you know mrs smith uh physically cannot do this please provide walk-up service for her uh and that's all they need okay so uh and that's provided at no additional charge uh just like our colleague uh had mentioned before um but Tony, you have an expectation about how many residents would take that, right? As far as before it would become excessive? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, experience with that uh, with different municipalities. And I'd say out of every 5,000, you might have 10, 15, uh, depending. You know, okay. Some municipalities are a little bit more, some are a little bit less. So, uh, but also with our proposal, um, we do have the Christmas trees. They're not going to be collected on route uh, as they used to be, uh, but we do have an option for that in there where we provide roll-off boxes for residents that do have live Christmas trees that want to get rid of them. We also have the bulk item collection, uh, which is once a month. Uh, and the only thing we ask on that, there's no additional charge for it, uh, is just that the, we're, we're notified of the addresses that have that bulk item. For the simple fact, it's more efficient if we know where we're going instead of driving up and down every single street in the city trying to figure out who's got an item out who doesn't uh, and it's a very simple process that we do with other municipalities too uh, but that's less wear and tear on your city streets as well um, and then finally uh, each resident would get a brand new cart uh, we would provide them uh, we would maintain them throughout the contract uh, if anything were to happen to it uh, normal wear and tear uh, we would replace it, replace lids, wheels, whatever it might be. So, uh, I do appreciate uh, being here tonight. I, I know you guys have quite a decision to make, uh, so I, I respect that. And if you guys do have any questions on our proposal, happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we will move on to uh, 7B, discussion of possible action regarding the proposals received from the solid waste and recycling collection contractors, including the impact on the budget, the level of service to be provided, possible implementation of the garbage fee, and the selection of a contractor proposal to enter into final contract negotiations with for the provisions of solid waste and recycling collection starting January 1st, 2023. I believe I'm turning it over to you now, Mr. City Administrator. Yeah, so for 2022, the city has $607,000 in its budget for garbage and recycling uh, collection. Um, and for our 2023 budget, we had 
uh, 0.2%, just over 0.2% net new construction in the city, which provided us about $12,000 growth in our levy limit. So there's very little uh, opportunity um, to increase our um, garbage and recycling costs significantly uh, without looking for some alternative source of funding, which would typically be going to the garbage fee. Uh, so with that being said, um, I'm telling you that relative to the budget, if you want to keep garbage on the levy, you really got to stick to something in the area of $610,000 or less. And that if we want to go higher than that, um, we'd be looking at something um, that would have to go on to a garbage fee. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? So with that being said, it really leaves you, if you want to stick with garbage being on the levy, uh, you could go to automated. Um, and uh, LRS Badgerland has some alternatives that would be within the range of what we could support on the levy uh, for automated. Uh, waste management would be within the range of what we could support on the levy for automated. Uh, but that neither of them provide any alternatives for people to subscribe to some kind of up the drive type of service. Um, one thing that as I'm looking through the proposals. Uh, if you look at the John's proposal, uh, they come in at $682,000, $683,000. Um, and if we were willing to say, hey, residents, we're going to provide you an opportunity where you can subscribe to up the drive, but in order to do so, we'd have to take away the, um, the bulk collection being included in what the city pays and require the residents to pay for bulk collection. Uh, again, that cost that Johns would charge would be $95 per trip per bulk collection. It's not $95 per item, but $95 per uh, visit. So you could put two or three bulk items out there for, for a visit. Um, I don't have a good feel for how much our residents use bulk collection. I know in the city of, of Brookfield, I've been at my house for over 20 years, and I think I count maybe three times I've put an item out for bulk collection. So it really comes down to, you know, do we want to pay $78,000 a year uh, so that our residents can put bulk items out? Or does it make more sense to have them pay directly that $95? Um, and then it gives us an opportunity where we can realize the savings of automated collection, but at the same time provide uh, our residents uh, that really need that up the drive feel um, that they could they could do the full walk up uh, collection and pay the extra two hundred forty dollars a year and and um, have that level of service. So those are my thoughts on as I analyze the different proposals we receive. But um, uh, obviously it's important to open up discussion amongst the council to talk about whether um, the cost savings of automated is something that we want to consider pursuing or do we absolutely positively need to provide some level of up the drive service. You know, seven years ago when we were talking about uh, automated versus up the drive, the, the cost savings was about $160,000 a year. Now it's grown to about $340,000 a year if you compare the lowest up the drive proposal to, uh, uh, to the LRS Badgerland proposal. So that's my thoughts on the subject, and I'd uh, look to open it up for discussion amongst the council. Well, Ta oh, go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll go first. Um, I Going back to the discussion we had, what, five years ago? Seven. Seven years Seven. ago. Wow, it seems. <laughs> um, I could get a different hobby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I was shocked at the response we got from the, from the survey and just feelers out in the community as far as how they really, really valued the up-to-drive service. Otherwise, I would be all over trying to say, use this as a budget win and doing every other week recycling and going with the lowest dollar um, at the curb pickup. Um, but knowing that that's not the case, and I think that based on, you know, the referendum we put out two years ago as well, people are trying to maintain the level of service that they have and are willing to pay a little bit for it. And I think the only one that makes sense to me as far as, well, the one that jumps out as far as offering that flexibility and getting down to that budget number is John's. That's, that's my summary of what I see on this. And, and it, when it comes to bulk collection, if that's something that, I mean, there's a number associated with it, 
and either everybody pays for the few people that use it or the people that use it now and then pay to have it done. So I would say kill it, kill it out of that proposal and then they're competitive with the others. I would agree with um, just about everything Alderman Iker said. Um, you extend a benefit, it is very hard to take that benefit away from people. And I know myself um, and everybody in my, most everybody in my neighborhood, they love the up the drive convenience. Um, I would agree that bulk, the utilization of bulk is minimal if I don't see it in, in my district. Um, so it appears at least John's has that flexibility on maintaining up the drive and um, some price leverage on, uh, on, that, uh, on that bulk item. Is bulk now included in our contract that we have now? It is, yes. But as you said, you don't have a feel for how many people are really using it. But I, I do not. I've not used it once in 25 years yeah. that I've been here, so yeah. I'm, I'm tending to agree with Matt and with uh, Tim. In our current bulk, it, it's included for free except for uh, free on appliances. There is a $25 fee currently. Well, I would just agree with Tim and Matt also because though my wife is disabled, I'm not, but I have a 100-yard driveway, so when I'm not available, taking out the garbage, you know, then we have to go through the murder and roll. Well, if she's disabled, who can do it? And if we have the option, we just say, hey, we'll pay for the drive, up the drive service, I'll pay for it. And then, and, and don't take it away from me, but if you give me the option, I'll pay for it. At what point do we need to decide whether, like, whether this is going to remain in the levy or be a fee? Like, would we be discussing that now? We could discuss it right now, or we could uh, ignore it um, you know, it, at, at this time, and we could talk about it again um, first, second quarter next year to, to put it on a fee for 2024. It's not something that there's an urgency to. Um, are, are you talking about looking at one of the higher proposals? No, okay. but I'm, no, I, I think John's is, I think that fits what we're looking for as far as our needs are. Um, but I'm just curious in, in the budget world in general, because the because this comes up often when we're having budget, budget issues, it's just such an easy thing to cut from, um, or it seems like an easy thing to cut from. I should say it seems like an easy thing to make cuts on, um, but in the reality, people like that service, so it's it's not as easy as it appears it would be. I feel like there, there might be some value in having that be a separate fee because then people can look at that independently from the regular budget. Um, yeah. That's my thought behind it is why maybe having that be a fee because then it's it's not every time we need we're having budget issues we're not looking at could we cut the trash. <laughs> that's yeah the other thing with regards to um, well, first of all let me say we're we're one of the last municipalities to still have our garbage on on the tax roll and one of the reasons for that is um, you can gain significant um, levy limit by putting something on the on a fee, whether it be garbage or fire. And the reason for that is, right now our, our garbage collection costs six hundred and seven thousand dollars. The people that made the state levy limit laws said that if you convert a service that you're char currently charging or currently funding by the levy, and you're going to charge a fee for it. You have to reduce your levy limit by, you have to take a reduction in your levy limit, but the reduction, for whatever reason, is based on what it cost you in 2013. So right now we're paying $607,000, uh, and, and also it only um, is based on the cost of just garbage, and you can exclude recycling with regards to the reduction. So our current um, budget supports $607,000, and we would only have to uh, reduce our levy limit by three hundred and some thousand dollars, and so it would be, you know, a, a win of about two hundred seventy or two hundred eighty thousand dollars. That then the city needs to make the decision of: Do we remove that from people's uh, taxes, or do we want to use that levy capacity to fund firefighter, a, a public works position, things that we've wanted to? Um, fund in the past but our levy limit hasn't allowed us to be able to do and if you don't use that capacity it's gone, it's gone. you lose it yep. or 
or the fact that we have a referendum for almost exactly that amount right now, that would balance out the referendum, correct? Yeah, but we're... <laughs> <laughs> that was what I said. We do have a budget meeting coming up, but like, you know, right now, um, in order to make ends meet, um, not only do we need that referendum amount, but remember, we're also using almost $200,000 a year in ARPA funds to make our budget work. Um, and um, Okay, but so we're, we're also talking about, I mean, fire and all those kind of things. So right now, I mean, anywhere that we have the ability to do that, and it makes sense and that we can explain what we're doing to the residents in a way that they, that they would be on board with, I think is important for us to, to do that. Yeah. But I, I think if the if this if the council wanted to go to like true up the drive, one of the nine hundred and some thousand dollar proposals, we'd have to talk about the fee tonight. No. If we're gonna <laughs> do something in the six hundred and some thousand dollar range, we've got the budget process to talk about the fee, or we could even defer it to be more of a twenty twenty four type decision if we want more time to make that decision and understand what we want to do with the uh, created uh, levy capacity. When does our current contract expire? This year. What so I'm saying, like, Wayne, is we could, if we could make the decision on who we're going to hire, and we could pay for it in the levy through the levy in 2023, and then convert it to a fee in 2024. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. So we can. Good work question. Yeah. I've never, you know, I, I know I've mentioned it before because this is, this is a topic that's near and dear to my, uh, the hearts of my constituents, and they, uh, I think we want to be able to offer that option of up the drive. I personally don't care. I'm happy to wheel, schlep my big schlep. bin out there <laughs> down to the uh, road. It, it's just, uh, but I know that a lot of people value that, and I like the idea of the fee um, option, you know, so people recognize the value. Um, but it's just something that I think if we pull that completely, Ooh, I don't want my phone will be ringing. You <laughs> <laughs> oh, surprised that same, what we heard seven years two. ago, there were a lot of very seven years upset ago, I was, people. I was, I was shocked. So actually. I'll just say I, I agree with what Tim and Matt and Wayne and Jackie and Danielle have said. <laughs> I tried to split it off to a fee seven years ago, but I was in the minority at that time, but it appears I'm in the majority this time. <laughs> that's because the dollars are very different. <laughs> and that's the thing I, I would love to tell my constituents and explain it. Yeah. So, so, so it, Tom, what we're talking about here is agrees with putting the 610000 in the, in the levy I, and then I charging a fee for the up to drive no service. No need for it, but my constituents nope. do. No, no. Well, yeah. It. The city wouldn't charge a fee for up to drive service. The contractor would. The contractor would, right. Yes. 240 for the yes. extra 240. Cool I have no problem with individuals oh. paying extra for extra services, right? It's, it's kind of customizing the service to your needs. Get, you can pay or you I, don't yeah. pay. Given the cost reality that we have, and, I mean, we'd I've, love to include it. And, and the citizens benefit from us competitively bidding this, right? And, and treating it as a whole group. We're, we're doing it this way, we're getting the best possible price for that type of service, we just can't afford to give it to them in their taxes as yeah. we have in the past because the yeah. costs have just gone up too much. I think people would understand a fee, you know, for trash collection. I've I've had that in other municipalities, and it's like, oh yeah, okay, kind of a, no big surprise. Um, regarding the up to drive service, I'm exactly with Jackie. I don't give a darn, but my constituents do. <laughs> they. They're all over that. They, District 2, a lot of people for various reasons that really want the up the drive service. I think they'll they'll pay if they have to pay extra for it or if it's included. I don't think it matters. Whatever works, but as long as it's available to them. Yeah, I just want to make make sure that it's clear that the two hundred forty dollar up the drive service. What that really is is you still have the ninety six gallon carts. Uh, you can leave them by your garage. The driver will come up, get the cart, take it down, dump it, and bring it back up to you. So, so there are, I've heard from one person who really doesn't like the 96 gallon carts, wants to stick with the 32 gallon cans and the, um, and, the and whatnot. And um, there's even an option in John's proposal for that if you want to stick with the garbage cans and, and the bins, but the price is to be determined based on the number of people that would want that um, service. That's a that's a 
big cart um, downtown. They, they, offer, be, they offered the smaller version, if you recall, now? too. Because it doesn't fit in your... Is that maybe we're going to have garbage carts outside, outside of the houses now, <laughs> ugly, uglifying the city? Well, Mark, you heard that option. You gave the example of the, yeah. the elderly couple, and they said, we only produce one bag of garbage a week. We don't need those giant cans. They exchange them for a smaller cart. They really don't want to wheel that around. I have a 32-gallon cart now, and the, the driver won't lift it to empty it because it's too big. So Grandma's going to be wheeling out a 96-gallon cart now? No, that, that's what I'm saying. They don't have to have the 96. Yeah, you can pay for yeah. that. Yeah. Because I won't need that. Like two people. Because some people house. won't. And those those carts, you, the ninety six gallon carts, those wheel pretty easily. Those are big they have wheels. wheels and... yeah. well, I think well, we need to discuss. This we have snow and ice here. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's why I said big wheels. Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to measure for, where I'm going to put it. <laughs> are we looking for a motion? You're looking a for a motion? No, just direction, correct? Just direction. Time? No, we'd we'd be looking for a motion here. Oh, yeah. If you know, if you want to select a. Um, a contractor and the, and the level of service that um, we're looking for. Uh, and then with that motion, I would enter into finalizing a contract with that contractor. Can you clarify and refresh my memory on John's uh, recycling? Where do, how do they handle recycling? Every week. Uh, once, once a week. Once a week, yeah. along with the 96er. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And so if anyone wanted to make a motion, I think what I'm hearing is um, to go with John's for their roadside collection proposal. Uh, but without the optional bulk um, inclusion. Also, and maybe. the up the drive option. But that's, yeah. The that's subscription. Subscription. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll what, move. What, what, move what about, could one more. What's that? Uh, one more discussion on an option before you move. The optional yard waste collection. They talked about they could do it twice a year. Does something like that make sense for us? Yeah, I think that's something that we would I think have the to weekly move. is overkill. <laughs> I don't want to, yeah, I'm not going to move to include that right now. That would be something that could we get maybe a we could proposal discuss after. Because <laughs> to be funded we get by a, a fee? Well, they said they could give us a, a quote for right. twice a year. We, we don't have any more room waste. in the capacity, yeah. in, the, in the levy. And we aren't providing that now either, right? No. Is it a current plan? So currently, um, People buy their own bags, and then they buy stickers from waste management. Um, so, so there is a subscription service for bag pickup of yard waste. As long as it's, that's a, not as long the city, it's that's an extra fee, I don't have any problem with it. If people want it, they can buy it. So, uh, yeah, I'd rather encourage, yeah, mulching and. And, you know, I mean, all that stuff that grows decomposes, that's what soil is. So I'd rather not, you know, create a whole bunch of collecting stuff that should, you know, I mean, I realize some people have huge yards and it's a problem, but some of us don't. And so I'd rather that remain like a fee and an option that people can look at. So as far as like right now, I wouldn't be keen to put that in the service. Yeah, certainly it'd be something that we'd have to negotiate, um, yeah, I'm quantify just, it, and uh, figure out how we're going to fund it. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. Not even once a year? Never, no. I'm, so we don't I'm have a motion yet, right? I, I moved, okay. but... <laughs> we never got a second. As soon as you have discussion, it's considered a second. There you go. So okay. Boom. I'm going to put my name I'll down. I'll second it. I think okay. Schaefer technically uh, continued the discussion on that. There you go. <laughs> So I had a first by Henry, the motion second was, by Schaefer. Oh, she'll read it again. To select John's for roadside collection proposal with the optional bulk service, without, without the optional bulk right. service, and with the optional up the drive subscription, and to enter into final contract negotiation for the provision of solid waste and recycling collections during January 1st, 2023. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd just comment. I'd like some of the, and I know it's going to be a learning process, but I'd like some of the negotiation be to kind of look out as far as um, what the subscription rate or attach fee attach rate would be for some of these additional services so that we can look at, make sure people are getting in a, a good ongoing value. Because we've got a price schedule for these optional services right now. I'd like to see one if, oh, okay, if 10% of the people are going to do up the drive, 
what would that cost versus be versus if 70% of the people do up the drive? I'd like to see some sort of pricing schedule for that so we can. For the true up the drive, and, and the only just, difference is that they can use the smaller cans. And well, no, I know, but you know what I mean. I mean, um, knowing up front, because we have, I don't know if that's all in the proposal or not. No, the, because if we get, so we've got how many, let's say it's 2,000 residents, and they've got some sort of attachment rate as far as how many customers are going to be subscribing to that service in mind for their per, for their fee. If we get a really high attach rate as far as 80% of the people want this, if that, instead of 240, maybe it'd be 200. You know what I mean? For your... Am I making myself clear? Like, I'd like to see a schedule as far as the volume, a volume discount for these additional services. Are you are you asking me to see if we can do better on the 240 if we get a certain number of people that that use it? Or are you talking about the to be determined number for true up to drive service with the smaller cans to get a schedule for that? Well, I, I, I'd like clarity both? for both. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'd agree with Tim. Just, just so that we, because we're negotiating on behalf of all the individual people. Otherwise, they're yep. all doing it on their own. And I don't, I don't know that we need. And it may be worthwhile to, to, to think about what options we might now want to. In that, those discussions, what, where's there, where's there efficiencies of scale for John's based on what our customers? Maybe may, their may assumption not want. is sixty percent, where we'll deliver ninety-five percent. But all those, all those things. I, I understand that any. Anyways, you get my just. I do. My, okay. Yep. I I was also gonna say if if um, for all the add-ons, like any of the subscriptions that the residents could, just having that clearly defined as well for any of for any of them, like if whatever is available to the residents that that's made available, that we know what that is. Yep. You mean like something that would be mailed yeah, to priceless. every homeowner explaining the fee? No, 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 just that, I mean, we could, something that we could post on our website that it's like, this is what our, what all of the available options to our residents oh. and what they are, what they are and what the costs are yep. associated with those. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to talk about it now, but we... No, 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 maybe, just when you say No, I'm just the, saying staff, we might want to talk about at some point doing some kind of postcard or something to sure. let people know. You know, they'll see the pins show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll throw it in the trash. It'll get, it'll get I'll say they never got it, but it, we'll know who did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what was the um, so the, the the small streets and the dead ends and the what was their solution to that? They said they too would use uh, some pickup trucks for that. They'd use smaller trucks for the. Those areas, okay. So, so if on, on the street that you live on, if people push them to the end of their driveway, that's what's included, right? Correct? Yep. But if they want them to go down their driveways, then there's a fee. They can pay for that and get it. Yeah. Yeah. If they can get it to the street, whatever the definition of the street is over by where you live, then they, they don't have to pay the extra fee. They, they won't have to pay the extra fee if they want down the drive service. Does that make, am I helping to clarify or am I not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of those elderly people and the, some of the 200 foot driveways and uh, trying to. It might be a deal. Yeah, I think that'd be a very I think good. Will work, work for everybody, yeah. Four bucks a week. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah, because there's some that it's a hot topic. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a motion. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Jason. You. Okay, we will move on to uh, eight consent agenda. Nothing on there. So we'll move down to nine, boards, committees, commission, and reports. Licenses. Um, we have the application in for Contento. So this has been an ongoing process with the town of Delafield. We went through the process of approving um, 
negotiations for the purchase of the reserve license. We approved uh, last council meeting the agreement. Um, now that that's been approved, Contento, uh, I did all the publications for that. Um, so this is issuing the license. I, I apologize. It's granting the license, which says that it's for them, pending them paying their fees. They have not paid the fees yet. I believe from my discussions with them that they're waiting for the official approval before they pay those fees. Don't blame them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which then, you know, we unfortunately will not get to keep the fees for this round of the reserve license. They will be paid to the town of Delafield. I move to grant the reserve license to Contento pending necessary fee payments. I'll second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions passes. Do we know when they're, when they're set to open? I, I can't hear you, Danielle. Oh, I just said, do we know when they're scheduled to open? We don't. Okay. Soon. We've been told soon. I, I've been but asked. That's all we know. <laughs> A few times, I'm like, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, we'll go to 9B, Planning Commission. Mr. Eicher. Yeah, we haven't had a uh, Planning Commission meeting since our last council meeting, but we do have um, action for the public hearing that was just uh, executed today. This is for the land use plan uh, map amendment um, for changing it from, uh, I believe it's institutional now, to... Um, uh, medium density residential. Initially there was uh, a, a proposal to make it high density. This pairs that down to medium. And uh, although there's still concern about how that's going to look, all that art and design is gonna come with any kind of a development plan that comes in. So the specific implementation plan and all that is gonna be something that the plan commission is gonna, gonna negotiate through and we'll see and get a chance to approve that as well in the future. But um, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, land use plan map as was recommended by the um, plan commission unanimously. A second. Discussion. So we're approving ordinance number 808? That's correct. I am sorry. That it, you make it so easy and I make it so hard. So yes, the motion is for an ordinance 808. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> All right, hearing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions passes. And, and I'll just comment the next, so we do have a meeting, uh, I believe, next week, next Wednesday. And this discussion about the possible land use changes for the Highway 83 corridor, I'm not a fan of that term, but that's what's being kicked around. Um, those are ongoing, and we did, we did suggest that our planner um, come up with a, um, uh, an actual uh, motion, I believe, or a, what do you call it? An ordinance? Resolution. Resolution, um, which is going to, I believe it's going to take a couple. I, I, it's, we're, we'll have one, but we're going to be discussing um, the, the ins and outs of that at our next um, plan commission meeting and probably go on to future meetings. I don't, by some miracle, we get it all figured out in a week. Um, we'll, we'll have a ref. Uh, some, a recommendation to the council, but I bet it takes a meeting or two. Um, so just, and, and with that in mind, also people need to remember that that there is a difference between um, land use and zoning. Um, so we, we just everyone needs to be cognizant of that we're going to keep repeating it, um, but but you can't do one without the other. So it is it is something to keep in mind. So I'll, that'll be something I report on as we go. Great, thank you very much. All right, C, Lake Welfare Committee. Okay, Lake Welfare met last Wednesday. Uh, one thing that we did uh, set, in, set in motion, uh, we revisited the imper impervious surf, uh, surface amendment that we put in last October. At that point, uh, we recommended to the Plan Commission that we wanted to have imper impervious surfaces not to be within 35 feet of, of the lake for everything except uh, boathouses and piers. Um, and we had also recommended at that time to be 50% of the entire lot be in, in, in previous service. Uh, the plan commission, actually the person from our Lake Welfare Committee was concerned about small lots not having the 50%, it wouldn't have enough left for, for a house. Uh, our committee was not concerned about the small lot because that wasn't the issue, it was the big, big lots that were filling it with all sorts of stuff. So we revisited that and met with Amy the week before the meeting. And uh, what we did was take the original uh, 
the road recommendations of a pure impervious surface to 50%, and then added to that two lots of 10,000 square feet and more. So that would allow a person to have a, a, a good sized footprint, a driveway, you know, all the normal things you would have. But it would eliminate, you know, putting in 10, 10 tennis courts and concrete the whole backyard, some of the things that's happening in some areas of the, of the city. So we uh, passed that 7 0, and we we're going to send that to the Plan Commission to revisit that again in that their January meeting. Let them get through the budget and we'll do it in January. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. All right, D, Park and Rec. Uh, no meeting since our last council meeting. Okie dokie. E, Public Works. Mr. Grimmer. Uh, Public Works had a meeting last week. We discussed uh, the priority of uh, the paths, path priorities, uh, which you should uh, see in our budget proposals uh, as we move towards the budget. And I think that I think that's it. Anything? Yep, that's it. Okay. Thank you for that report. Uh, F. Delahart Commission, Mr. Eicher. Yeah. Um, the last news I left off was we were looking for a finance director and treasurer, and um, we had a special meeting tentatively scheduled for tomorrow to discuss options for recruiters if we didn't have a suitable number of applicants and. That meeting was canceled. I believe we have a good candidate that is we're progressing through the hiring process with. Um, so we may have a good replacement for Rose. So that's good news. Next meeting is uh, uh, second week of November. In this labor market, that is great news. All right, G Police Commission. Uh, we Jackie? haven't had a meeting. We have one scheduled for the twenty seventh. The twenty second. Seventh. Seventh. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, library board, Ms. Henry. Hi, yeah, we met last Tuesday. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, there have been some turnover, so they're in the hiring process right now for a position. They've been doing targeted marketing as a new strategy for um, reaching um, citizens about their interests and sending out notifications and emails that are directed towards um, their interests, which has been really positively received. There have been over 200 signups just for that. Um, and the community engagement's been really good. The, newslet the newsletter open rate is over 55%, um, which is enormous compared to most nonprofits that are about 25%. So our community is really engaged with the library. It's really great to see. Um, the health insurance budget came in less than that was expected, so that's been good for the library's budget. Um, and there is a board member vacancy um, now that I think is even on the agenda for tonight, but um, so we'll be seeing someone there. Um, we approved the holiday schedule for 2023, um, and the book sale at the Fish Hatchery is now um, the first and third Saturday of the month. Sounds good. Thank you very much. All right, Zoning Boards of Appeals, I don't think anything, correct, Jackie? Correct. Okay, Jay, Promotion and Tourism Commission. Uh, no October meeting this month. No meeting, okay. Uh, K, Lake Country Fire and Rescue Commission, not a meeting that I'm aware of. L, Lake Country Fire and Rescue Board, Mr. Grimmer. We have a meeting on Thursday, 5 p.m., Station 1. Um, CPI for the, the CPI budget, um, CPI came in at 9.7% uh, versus the 7.5 that we budgeted, and health insurance was budgeted at 5.4%, instead came in at 2.4%. So we'll be um, uh, discussing uh, those adjustments to the budget. And also uh, consideration of um, the village of Oconomowoc Lake. Um, proposal, um, which allocates um, our capital spend to operations for the 2023 uh, budget and then utilizes um, some fund balance for that as a, a means to uh, immediately um, um, fund the 2023 operations. I'm sorry, did you say that meeting is this coming Thursday? Yes, Thursday. At Five. At five. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. 
Uh, M, other committees, commissions, and boards. We have deer management. Ms. Henry. We've not met since last week. But they're hunting deer out there, right? They are. Yeah. That's <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to 10, unfinished business. A, update regarding the city's opposition to the proposed monotube traffic signal installations on the WDOT South 83 resurfacing project currently scheduled for construction in 2025, but could be moved up to 2024. And the city's request for consideration of better, more suitable alternatives be considered that would fit in better with the area aesthetics. Tom. Yeah, if you might recall, the council discussed this back in 2020, and I think it was specifically Jackie and Tim that had some significant concerns about the monotubes. And uh, I took those concerns back to, w, uh, to DOT in 2020, and they told me that they would look into alternative designs and provide some pictures of alternatives that could be considered. Didn't hear back from them for a year, and got, I reached out again in 2021 and uh, asked the same questions and didn't hear from them again. And now just recently, I heard from one of their design engineers asking um, about whether the city wants curb ramps installed at uh, Oakwood in 83. I said, yes, we do. And I said, what, what's going on with those monotubes? And he said, oh, let me check. And uh, I finally did get a response from DOT, and the response was, um, it's going to be monotubes. Uh, there is no other alternative. Um, they uh, identified their rationale for it, and I can read that off here real quick. They talk about uh, monotubes providing a factor of safety as far as being able to provide a signal head over each lane as compared to the older style trombone arms, which would be a safety improvement, especially in terms of signal visibility to the motoring public. Uh, flashing yellow arrow signals are the standard and we will need monotubes to align them over the left turn lanes. And lastly, the crash reduction factors for monotubes with overhead signals per lane are 23% reduction in right angle crashes and 3% reduction in rear end crashes and a 19% reduction in left turn crashes um, with the installation of the flashing yellow arrow signals. So they've made it quite clear that um, they will not give consideration to any other alternatives and let us know, um, this leads into the next agenda item, that uh, the only alternative that we have for an aesthetic improvement is uh, they come as a standard gray color and um, if we want to pay an estimated $2,500 per intersection uh, times two intersections that we could have them painted black and they said in some municipalities choose to do that and as a uh, aesthetic upgrade so are we move into the next agenda item or well that's my update and i, I think <laughs> i think we would uh, open it up to any discussion by the council but i don't think we're getting anywhere with regards to pushing the issue um and then uh, if there is no discussion or after discussion then we can uh, go to the issue of whether we want to um, pursue the paint upgrade is this something we can decide after they're already up and say, oh, that looks awful, um, or that's not so bad? I, I believe this would be factory painted. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. we, you're not going to get up there. And no. <laughs> and, and, and the, qual the quality of the paint job in the field would not be um, near, <laughs> near what it would be in the, in the factory. I'm, I, I'm surprised that, that painting them black would make them look any better. Yeah, I actually, I have no idea. But you know what we're talking about, right? Paint, well, paint, but, um, I think it would, I, I, I'm not convinced that it's needed, but I think it does make it look a lot better when they are black like that, factory painted. But there's maintenance issues that go along with that. I, I find it $2,500 for an entire intersection actually seems kind of inexpensive to me. But um, I'm not convinced that it's needed, but I, I think there is an aesthetic difference. When there you go is. down a community that has all black difference. ones, it, it looks different. It almost fits in with um, a lot of the accessories with the street, street tape that are usually like kind of a wrought iron type look and things like that, I think. Mm -hmm. Railings and stuff. I'd... So is this, okay. They're just I'd, ugly. I'd say, I'd say if... Really if they don't, if they want to insist around. that they're ugly, um, I think we should try to do what we can to make them look better. I mean, we're going to be living with them for as long as there's. Forever. I don't know what the warranty is on the paint, but like per intersection, what is it? Three of them? Two, two, two intersections. Two intersections. Five grand. Twenty-five hundred. Yeah. A little better. 
Yeah. It would be a capital budget item, right, for 2024 or sure. 2023 I'd say put something. it in the budget. We can, yeah. we can pull it out if we think it's something we need to kill, but they, they are really ugly. I just, my <laughs> thought, too, is we could potentially ask Heartland if they would want a cost share with yeah, us. Yeah, that's a good idea. There you go. Yeah. I think, yeah, I agree with Jim. Yeah. Put it theirs. in the budget, and then if we need to uh, pull it out of the capital Same, budget. Yeah. We pay more for less impactful things that you don't see, that, with bike racks and other stuff to make them look better. So, anyway, I'll, I'll find out when they need um, a commitment from us by. But they're they're looking to get you know finalized plans and specifications for the project is what they're doing. They t they typically bid the project out a year before construction, which could potentially be you know bidding it out next year. But um, I'm sure it's a minor enough issue that they could figure out a way to. Um, Bid that as an alternative or something like that. But I'll work with them. Okay. Okay, so I guess we're going on to B for a motion or no? No, I think I got the direction I need. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Then we are going to 10C, discussion regarding Lake Country Fire and Rescue staffing and funding, including the 2023 budget and estimated fire fee projections for years 2024 through 2026. Yeah, at the last council meeting, the, the council asked uh, for me to get together and work with the uh, fire chief, who is here tonight, to um, help with the discussion as needed, um, to identify what the costs would be uh, if we were to go to a fire fee for 2024, 2025, 2026. Put together the memo. Um, there's some important information in there. Um, the fire chief wants to make sure that it's understood that these are estimates, best you know, best scenario estimates at this point that the fire board still has not reviewed. Um, and if you look at it, there's, we kind of came up with two approaches for how to pay for it. And certainly those approaches can be tweaked uh, and refined, but we looked at a straight rooftop approach um, where we're looking at um, uh, what would be a 2024 fee of $671, 2025 fee of $829 and a 2026 fee of $926. And then we also looked at an approach that um, uh, allocated more of the cost to the commercial properties uh, to indicate that um, you know there can be more costs involved with fighting a fire for larger buildings and whatnot and more of a risk uh, of fires in, in some commercial buildings. And so by doing a, a allocating 65% of the cost to the residential uh, tax base and 35% to the commercial tax base, um, what that resulted in was, um, and you'll see it in the memo, for 2024, a commercial fee of $1,917, a residential fee of just shy of $500. Uh, for 2025, the fees are $2,370 and $614. And for 2026, it's $2,648 and $686. So there's some substantial fees, especially considering uh, what we're paying now. Uh, actually, in this chart, in my memo, there is one mistake, and that is the 2022, what the fee would be if we were supporting our current budget with a fee. Um, that that's actually should be 364 instead of 399. And um, you know, as far as total dollars, what we're looking at is um, current budget of uh, about a, a million and forty thousand dollars, and in four years, that would rise um, up to about 2.65 million dollars. Um, there is a significant need. Uh, the chief went over that with you. Uh, there are, um, there is a significant problem right now with brownouts in the city of Delafield Station. It is affecting our response times, and um, you know, combined with police, it's certainly the most important uh, service that we provide to our residents. So it's an important topic, and um, uh, so this is the information that you asked for, um, and as we move forward, we're on a tight schedule as far as if we want to go to a referendum. Um, that referendum, in order to be on the April ballot, we'd have to approve final ballot language on January 16th, uh, and the issue should be um, introduced at both meetings in, in December at a minimum. Um, but as we go through, we, we need to talk about things like, do we want to go to referendum for fire funding, or is the council at all comfortable with making the decision based on the importance of the service to go forward without a referendum. Uh, if we go to referendum, do we know that we want to do a fire fee? 
or would we be looking more for a levy limit increase? Um, as we talked about with um, the garbage, uh, if we go to a fee, it creates um, some unused levy capacity that we could use for other things, or we could choose not to tax uh, residents for it, or we could do a combination of both and kind of uh, tax for some of it and give some tax relief with some of it. Uh, and then lastly, what the chief has mentioned that um, uh, I think the LCFR staff is supporting kind of a unified fire fee uh, that would be consistent amongst most all municipalities. That's not what you're seeing here. This would be just the city paying for its costs. Um, and under a unified fee, um, it would result in more equitable allocation of costs and a reduction of costs allocated to city residents. Um, the reason for that is under the current LCFR agreement, um, it started with kind of a base um, fee that each community is responsible for, and that's based on what their budget was coming into um, the agreement. So uh, it wasn't completely uh, allocated based on the formula, but that base fee was based more on what each community could afford to pay, and then, and then a portion gets run through the formula on an equitable basis. Um, any questions on that? So just for everybody's benefit, can you, do the numbers that you have here just for simple calculations, the rooftop ones, and I think it's the same questions I asked last meeting, but I just make sure I, I have it right. So in 2022, the citizens were currently paying in this year's budget $364 already? Correct. And so in 2023, there be, the increase would be the difference between 532 and 364, or we add 532 to the 364? No, they'd pay 532, so the increase would be the difference. The difference. And then, so that, and then when you go to the 670, um, is it only the difference again? Each of those numbers is what they would pay in that year. In that year, okay. Yep. Total. Total, yeah. Okay. That's... And that's taking the city's total operating budget for LCFR and putting it into that fee. Yep. So then at the end, 2026, if you minus out 364, that's the difference over the whole time. Correct. So it's a net increase of 364. What? It'd be a net increase of 364 over the current year? 542. Two. 926. What are you asking for an increase from what? With the, with the, the net increase is what we're currently paying already in the budget, and then we're, we're bumping it up and for a fee. Just want to be kind of clear. For the, for the ultimate fee in 2026? Yeah. The difference would be? 542. 562? Yeah, we're currently paying 364. Yep. With no increase. We're currently paying 364. That's today. And that fee would climb to 926. To 926. Okay. Difference of 562. Per year. So no matter how you slice it, we're talking about increasing the funding by 154% over four years. So if we go to a referendum in, in April, what happens to the start of this year? Everything gets put off until the next year? So the council's gonna have two choices in your budget. No matter what, we're, we're gonna be funding LCFR um, CPI plus 2%, which is a 9.7% increase for them. Um, it's gonna be in the budget um, in the traditional manner that it's always been, meaning that if you approve it um, the way it's in the budget, that um, about $1.1 million will go to them for use in operating, and about $200,000 will go to them for use in capital. The alternative would be, if you want to approve the Village of Oconomowoc Lake plan, you would be giving them permission to spend that $200,000 that's intended for capital on 2023 operating, and supporting the use of about $400,000 of their own fund balance. Um, but right now, um, there's no 
definition on how that capital budget or that fund balance would be replenished. And actually, of that $400,000 fund balance, about $200,000 of it belongs to the city of Delafield. So there's a disproportionate contribution by the city. But I th that would have to be... Matt, I, I think they'd be using the $400,000 in the name of all the communities, yeah. but knowing that they would have to pay back Correct. Delafield, Shaniqua, and Neshota in the future. Correct. If, if we would seek a unified fire fee or some way that it just seems we're paying 41% of the total for the seven communities, roughly. That's a lot. <laughs> yes, yeah, so what, that, what happened when, when communities were interested in coming into LCFR, they came to us and said, this is what our budget is, and that's what we can afford to come in at. Take us or leave us. And even though they weren't paying a proportional share compared to what Delafield or Schneeko or Neshota were, it was still advantageous slightly from an ad operational perspective and significantly from a capital perspective. When you look at the ladder truck that we just purchased for $1.1 million, under LCFR 3, the city of Delafield would have been responsible for 78% of that $1.1 million. Now we're responsible for 40-some percent of it. And any other capital purchase, same ratio. Doesn't seem like they're paying, they're still not paying their fair share. They're not. And, and if, I, I think it's everybody better. would acknowledge but, that, yeah. but that was, that was the understanding coming into it. Mm -hmm. But this is really a game changer. And, so, and you know, some of those communities that are paying disproportionately less are the ones pushing the hardest for we've got to do this and, and, and we need to move forward. And so perhaps they would be motivated to um, renegotiate something and, and look at it, um, a unified fee over all communities. And a unified fee over all communities would make a lot of sense. It would simplify things uh, rather than, you know, different homes and different communities paying different fire fee amounts. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just say I'm, I'm still a little bit shell-shocked as far as how, why we're at exactly where we're at, okay? Um, but I, I'd be interested in knowing, so I can help explain this to, to people, um, is understanding it's staffing, primarily staff, right? That we're, is the issue mm -hmm. how coming into 2022 you know what our staffing levels were and what to a person those employees cost which ones we lost and why and who we plan on replacing them with and how much that is like so just a simple table of the number of employees at each station you know or on, on total staff you know 2019 20 21 and then why they're not there anymore and who you know how many we need to replace them with is it body for body so i mean just a table would be helpful for them sure tim sorry i was just walking up as yeah. you were so can you just rephrase what you're looking for exactly yeah like how how we were um how we were positioned to because this is a this is a situation that's been presented to us starting mid-summer of mm -hmm. this year absolutely so coming in this time last year how how were we positioned in lcfr with staffing you know the, the number of people at each at each level and from each source part-time interns volunteer whatever um and then how that table of people from like let's say 2019 2020 2021 were doing the job and who we lost and who we need for next year because that's that's where my disc it seems like it's almost seems like we don't have anybody on staff anymore we have to hire we're it's like we're our costs are tripling and then are going up whatever 154 percent over the next 
uh, few years. Some of that's inflation and stuff, but um, just a, a staffing table of where we were the last years running and where we're at now, so I can help explain. Yeah, I'm certainly happy to provide that. It is a part of the staffing plan that we did on the September 12th meeting. Um, and the very simple answer to that is, is that currently, and when we came into the 2021 consolidation, the daily staffing for the organization was 12 people on duty 24-7, 365. That 12 people on duty 24-7, 365 consisted of six that were full-time capacity. So half of that uh, 12 was in the full-time variety and the other half was part-time uh, and intern type positions. And really where we're in jeopardy is the part-time and intern positions as everyone is experiencing problems with the part-time labor market. It is affecting us uh, tremendously. Um, so we've, I guess, for 50 years revol or, you know, relied on, I'll call free and low cost labor mm -hmm. um, to meet the daily needs of the citizens of all of the communities. And that is what is collapsing in front of our very eyes. Um, there's been two paradigm shifts in hiring practices um, of a larger and career organizations. So the you know Milwaukee suburb type organization, City of Waukesha, um, where forever they would use and only hire firefighter paramedics to come into their organization. And in January of this year, the first agency changed because of the retirements that they're seeing and they dropped their minimum requirement to firefighter EMT. So now uh, the people that we would get and retain for three to five years to fill those part-time duties um, are now going, excuse me, and working at a city of Waukesha where we can pay them, you know, $16, $18 an hour, and they're making, you know, 60,000 a year start, topping out around 90, um, plus benefits and retirement and everything like that. So it's really no wonder where they're going. Um, the, the other shift that's happened uh, recently has been the as far out as Madison, which is probably one of the premier fire departments in the state. Um, they've actually dropped their hiring requirements down to high school diploma and driver's license. They will teach you EMT and they will teach you firefighter. Um, so that means they're going <coughs> to capture people before we would even see them mm -hmm. um, come into the field. So it's, uh, it's really those are the paradigm shifts that have really made it where it is today. Um, I, in the, the email I sent to Administrator Hafner today, uh, we know of approximately 50 hires that are gonna happen in the Metro Milwaukee area next year of open positions. Uh, Western Lakes being 22 of them. Um, New Berlin uh, received a safer grant for nine hires. Uh, there's six gonna happen in the city of Waukesha. And that's not, you know, we're barely even to the Milwaukee Waukesha County line yet. So we anticipate that over 50 hires will happen next year full-time, new time, new hires, uh, which is going to significantly erode at the 19 active part-time and paid-on-call people that we have, of which 17 of those are career seekers, where they're doing this to get that full-time job and to, to land their dream job. So um, it's unfortunate we don't see this getting any better anytime soon. I wish I could sit here in front of you and say that mm -hmm. we see the light, but it, it just isn't there. Um, we've had a number of, you know, long response time type incidents lately, which has really brought it to the forefront. Um, and the board gets briefed on them every month. Um, but, you know, for instance, uh, about two and a half weeks ago, we had a car accident where it took us 26 minutes to get an extrication engine on scene of a rolled over car. Um, that's far too long. We, we can't keep doing that kind of thing. It's, it's putting everyone at risk. So mm -hmm. very tough conversations to have, uh, but we need, we need to everyone to know about it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I understand that. Um, is there, I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's something that can be pulled. I, I mean, I'd like to see that flow chart of the, the staffing levels, like what their, you know, yeah, what absolutely. the salary was and, you know, how that's moving forward and how, where, the, where that erosion's taking place. It's because in that presentation that from the September 12th, it's, yeah. it's in there. The there was a table chart. with all that in that. Yeah, pull it back up. I don't think you were there, though. It's I, I saw the presentation. I, um, this one? It's just an org chart, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I was talking about like the actual. I didn't. Was there a salary total and like paid per position and like number at each level or no? 
Because we're repl are you, are you, is this is this we're going to 100% full time? Is that correct? Over the course of four years, the plan calls uh, to transition over to 100% full time. There will always be a place for part time and paid on call individuals that want to serve the communities and do it in that capacity. Um, however, they'll be used to fill in vacation days, to do special projects, to do um, things like that, and, and help us with our surge capacity. Uh, but I think the days of relying on them to meet the mission on a daily basis um, will sunset in the very near future. Matt, isn't it reasonable to expect that in the ultimate build out that there still would be a place for, you know, you get these high school kids coming into the training center and that perhaps once they get certified that they could they could fill they could literally fill a position not just vacation but fill one of the spots for a year or two until they get their career job and when they leave a new a new high school kid that gets his certification comes up and fills in i think that's a reasonable and a great goal to have however the what we're seeing in the current market it's just not existing so we have those intern positions now um, and we've had we've ran four processes over the course of the year to fill the vacant positions that we have and we've received zero applicants for them so you know I, I don't have the crystal ball to look at what it would be four years from now but I can tell you the past history that we've had um, it was a very successful program from the launch uh, of it because it provides those high school individuals uh, with free college tuition and everything yeah. um, but it it just it hasn't, and, and all the programs around here that are utilizing it are experiencing the same type of um, thing. So, and maybe that'll be cyclical. And if if so, you guys would would retain spots for that cheaper labor, a couple spots. And but let's certainly hope so. And I mean, it's something we can report back to the board and and keep continuously status monitoring it. Uh, but it's at this point it's not something that i think we need to we can base our daily staffing on unfortunately as much as i would like to say absolutely so my the simpler version of my question is or just the request for information is the six part the six positions that we're filling you said there's six that were, that were uh full time that's a combination of part time intern mm -hmm. coming into this in, into the merger um what's the so like for let's say for 2022 or if those six positions for part-time and intern were totally f filled what's the what are we paying them that's like what is that number in the budget like running up from do you know what that was or no kevin keith taught me a long time ago not to do math yeah yeah right <laughs> no no i'm not i'm not i mean to put you on, i'm just i'm that's I a number i'm curious about for you. um just you know what how good a deal those people were that we're not getting anymore is really it, what I'm trying to extrapolate. 100%. I mean, put it to you this way, we would fill three positions 24-7. And, and I think it's probably, as, as you're talking through it, when we talk daily positions, you need to multiply that number by three because we have right. shift, sure. you know, one that works 24 hours, shift two that works 24 hours, yeah. shift. So it's, it's really, you know, multiplied out by three. Um, but when you take those numbers and you multiply it 24 hours times, you know, $18 an hour times 365 days a year, um, it, it's far, it, it's about 127,000 per day. And that's where we're at is, you know, the, to fill a position is 126,000 per position, 124,706, I'm sorry. Right. No, I get it. So, I mean, that makes sense. I, I did, yeah, no, I did, I did the six times three, 18, you know, mm -hmm. um, times 100 grand a year is $1.8 million. And the ask is for more than that. That's if they're all, the ask is for more than that. And we're not getting any credit for the six people that we're replacing. That's, I'm just not doing, I don't see the, sure. I'm just trying to balance the numbers in my head. So yeah, I, I, we can provide that complete financial okay. analysis right. for you. And Matt, there's a small amount included in the ask besides staffing, right? Yes, there's a couple of projects that were identified by staff as we've gone through um, the uh, this whole process as we try to pr prepare a, a, I'll call it a four or five year budget. Um, some of those, uh, one of those is a, an additional staff person to, for a mechanic position. Um, 
Our fleet is aging, as we all know. Uh, capital is becoming harder and harder to replace. Um, it's becoming more and more costly to replace. Uh, and as we're experiencing problems finding people, so are the um, service companies that we rely on. So to have a person on site to keep that fleet on, in service, I think our fleet is uh, assessed at like 6.3 million. So um, to have that person there. The other thing that we've discussed is an HR person. Uh, but again, that, that needs board action to further kind of vet that whole plan out. Uh, there are a couple um, other projects in there in terms of a software enhancement, things that we haven't been able to do for the past five years, 10 years, because we've been bound by everything. So if we're presenting a, a plan that needs to get us into the five years, things that we're trying to identify and, and, and provide a, a safe and reasonable plan. At. More, more information is, is good. Um, the, you know, I saw an exchange uh, that was shared with the council as far as the memo and the question and answer. Um, you, re you, you referenced the city of Pewaukee, and I mean, I, I pulled up their budgets, come, I, I think it's 2019, up to 2023, whatever. Um, they had a five-year plan, and they showed 2019 numbers, and their call volumes are almost this, exactly this. It's eerily similar to Correct. what you're dealing with. And so seeing those comparisons and what budgets are will help. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the more of those we can get to translate geographic size, types of calls, types of call volume, response times, what it actually costs for everybody else. I mean, we could possibly establish that we've had the best deal running for the longest time and we just need, we're just, it's time to catch up. So, but all that data helps and knowing that we have to explain this via referendum or however we're going to approach it. Um, Absolutely. More information is better. <laughs> Absolutely. And, I mean, really, and, and it's said in the email, but to, for the public that's watching at home, I mean, kudos to this Common Council for having the leadership to go back, you know, 15 years ago and start really thinking about doing this and, and what you have put together because you do have the best deal running for these citizens and the best service out there. Um, it's unfortunate we're in the situation we're in right now, but we will um, be delivering that again at some point. So. Hey Matt, this is obviously a problem affecting all cities around here. Correct. Um, how are the larger cities like Tosa and uh, West Dallas and these people, how are they handling it? They, their problem must be just as severe as ours. Well, no. Or were problem, they always full-time? Correct. Previously? They made the transition to full-time, to be a full-time agency in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so because they don't need to oh. add people, because they're not relying on the, the job market that's evaporating, um, they're they're far better off than we are. Um, their problem and why they're lowering their standards probably isn't the correct word, but why they've reduced their hiring requirements is that they are they're seeing um, an increase in retirements with less people coming in, in the door to fill those positions, less qualified candidates. Um, so really, I mean, we're we want to be position ourselves uh, to be one of the first groups to hire instead of the last groups to hire because we want to get the best candidates that we have for these citizens and for our communities. So, um, yeah, the, the answer to your question, Paul, is that the city of Waukesha and the larger agencies, they've been career, the Racine agencies have been career um, east of Caledonia for um, going on well over 20, 25 years. So. You know, which might be an interesting thing to help us show this to our people is maybe a chart of what the, not the per diem, but the, the per person cost mm -hmm. for Tosa and all these larger cities and where, where we were. Now, all we're just actually going up to where everybody else has been paying anyways. And that's mm -hmm. correct? Yep. So being able to show that would really help us explain that to our absolutely. people here. Yep, absolutely. The um, part-time and... Interns uh, obviously don't have the certifications that your full-time people have, right? I mean, they're not as qualified currently. Uh, some of them have. Uh, our part, some of our part-time people have the firefighter paramedic certifications. Um, very few of them do at this point, and those are the ones that are their career seekers, and they're they're looking to gain the position somewhere else. Okay. So um, my question is, do you need to repl do you need to replace? Like, could you? lower the qualifications for certain positions so that you're not hiring, so not all of your staff is has such a high standard? Sure. Uh, the answer to that question is on the full-time side um, and just the way that the union contract is negotiated, we 
don't pay any more. They don't get a stipend to be a paramedic. Um, so they're basically getting paid the same as a city of Waukesha firefighter EMT. Um, it's just our minimum requirement to come to the job. So um, we are giving you that bang for the buck already kind of thing. If that makes sense. So there's no cost saving? Not, not to lower the standard and to hire right. firefighter EMTs, right. no. And even at that, the um, the paramedic stipend that they get at larger agencies is like fifteen hundred dollars a year. So, but could that be something that you structured into where there's you have so many positions that do get a stipend and then could fill more positions with with people that are not do not have the paramedic? Um, I, I think maybe I didn't answer that correctly the first time. Oh, okay. Um, right now, we're paying firefighter paramedics what firefighter EMT makes at large, EMTs make at a larger organization. So you're already getting that bang for the buck that you're asking for. Right, no, I, what I'm talking about is, oh, I guess I don't understand, because you're, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> Unless I'm not hearing her correctly, so. Um, no, I guess I don't, know how to, I don't know how to say it the right way, so I'm just, um, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, so I'll let that go for now. Sounds good. <laughs> Sorry. No, give me a call tomorrow or something. Okay, when I figure out how to phrase it, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll send you a Happy message. Happy to do it. Matt, is there any reason that we aren't using a fee today for this? Mark, I, I can't hear you. you, you got to bring that we're not, up. To, today we're not on a, on a fee. We don't, have a, we don't see this $366 fee. Is there some reason that... A fire fee has never been discussed method. in the cities until, I'd say, July of this year. I'm sorry? The it's never been a point of discussion until July of this year, putting fire on a fee. Okay. And if you're asking me why, um, the levy has been adequate to support it in the past. Um, it's we just had, yeah, I think we had a system that worked very well, and now it doesn't. And we, you know, we went along with it, and maybe we should have looked down the road. But it, people are be, are able to get full time, you know, with benefits jobs for having um, not the qualifications um, that we want. And why wouldn't they go for those jobs? So when you post, you said four times for positions, and you get exactly zero applications. We need, we need to, you know, um, face the music that the system that was working no longer does, the way I understand it. I guess my only question is, if we're part of this group, why aren't we all paying similar amounts? Why are we... The thought was because Dell of the City had a higher utilization. Gotcha, okay. Based on call volume, mm -hmm. higher population. Okay equalized value that we our our fair share should re be reflective of that that's how the yeah, yeah that's yeah. how the funding gotcha. formula I mean, Matt, worked that, on that's volume. not exactly true that's that's so the, that's the funding that's formula the, how is that's the funding the formula, formula not true? but but this this IMA includes a, f a fixed amount of well yes yeah, no I'm referring to IMA 3 okay this budget yes we worked very hard to yeah. get a fixed rate because of the concerns that you raised. Okay. But we still pay the, more based on that the, formula. The fixed rate does not favor Delafield. The fixed rate favors the communities that said, this is all we budget for fire. We'd like to still come in. We can't pay any more. And they were still of value to us, even though they weren't paying as um, an equitable amount compared to what we were paying. Matt, do I, am I saying that right? Yes, I mean the the fixed component of it. I think it, it was a. I thought it was a win win when we developed it. Tom was because it provides the stability. Yep. Because as you remember, when we were call volume based, it was a fifty percent based on call volume, and the city put in. Uh, you know, there was a, a skilled nursing facility built in the city, which took the call volume and went uh, up by a substantial amount, which started to provide some instability to it. So the fixed portion of the budget really was designed to provide that stability for it. Uh, I think, Tom, what you're trying to get at is that the Lake Country and the city of Delfield, dating back to the year 2000, has slowly started to invest in, in full-time people and slowly started to get themselves out of it. And the formula, because of the way it was built, was built to take what everyone was paying at that time into consideration. Is that probably the fair yeah. statement that, you're, that we were trying to reach? Yeah. 
is it true that no, I mean, no, no matter what we decide to do, it's gonna we're not it'll it'll matter what the other communities decide to do as well, right? We're not. I mean, if we Absolutely. okay, <laughs> like if we agree to all of it and the other communities agree to <laughs> half right. of it, we're not going to be on the hook for all of that, right? No, we'd be only we'd only be responsible for our for our, for our, our fair share. Okay. Which is more than that we agreed fair. to. <laughs> yeah. Right. We're only responsible for our share per the agreement. Okay. Hey man, how comfortable do you feel in driving down the fund balance for a short term solution? But I'm more comfortable with that than continuing to brown out fire stations and having 26 minute response mm -hmm. times to car accidents. Good answer. Um, we, we can't continue to do that. We had a pulseless non-breathing patient over the weekend that we had to call mutual aid for. We, we can't keep doing this. When I, when I, and I know I said this at the last meeting, when I sent out your presentation to my constituents who are on my email um, group, um, every person, every single person was supportive of, of some sort of fee. They, they were appalled at the idea of brownouts, and not in a bad way, but like, no, we, we need to have this service. So, um, yeah, I think, I don't think, I don't see it as an option. It's not like, yeah, let's, let's not have firefighters, you know, because that's where we're heading. The, the fee, I like in general, the principle of the fee because of the transparency of it. The reason I'm asking why we don't use that today is I'm just kind of looking at the surface. Okay, I like the idea of a fee, but is there some other reason that's not? Is there a disadvantage to that impact to the something else that I'm not seeing? That's that's why I'm asking, Tom. No, there's no disadvantage. Um, and as I said with the garbage, there's a potential advantage where it is a strategy that municipalities have used um, to be able to um, fund things that they want to fund for local services and whatnot, um, even if the levy limit does not allow for it. I would say there, there used to be. Uh, I don't think it's a disadvantage right now, but if you're not putting something on the levy, it's not deductible on an individual's taxes. That's not as critical now because of salt the uh, state and local tax limits where you're you're capped um, but not everybody's capped and so you can't deduct that fee from your taxes we also talked about that if it's in the levy then it's proportionate to how you're paying how what each individual property pays is proportionate to the levy versus the a, fee a, which is not versus the rooftop yeah fee. that it's you're gonna end up a fees regressive. Yeah. So the difference between budget, this is more philosophical as far as than garbage because your house is going to get picked up once a week. How often do you need the fire department? And should you pay for that fire department based on how much your home is worth or how many rooftops you have or how many residents you have? You know what I mean? So it's a way you different our <laughs> situation. I mean, so we need to vet the different funding vehicles to figure out what's going to be equitable. And it's a tough discussion. Yeah. Because, like I said, the, the closest example I can come up with is how we assess the roundabout and the traffic improvements over by Century Albrecht. So it took us a, it took us a couple months, and we're being told we got to try to come up with some magic formula by Jan, middle of January, so we have to start working. And it starts with the budget, right? I mean, these numbers are real helpful to understand what the per house, per citizen impact is. However, we want to divide it out. Yeah. We're gonna have a discussion. We're gonna have a decision to make at the budget time, and, and yeah. this is the beginning of it. So. Yeah, my exact reason I argued it for the garbage fee is like when you have a fee, it seems it, it gives the appearance of discretionary. Like if there's an issue with it, it, it makes it very clear what you can argue against. When we're talking about the fire, I don't believe that that's a discretionary fund. I mean, that, that's not a discretionary expense. Like we, we need that. What, what it comes out to is, is different, but we can't just decide not to have fire or or to you know i mean like that, right. that's what i mean it's it's exactly. it's really different and so for the exact opposite reason that i argued for
the garbage to be on a fee. I would argue against having fire on a fee. If you don't have garbage collection, I bet you get more complaints. Right, but you could have, <laughs> but, but there's options as far as what kind of service, and it's purely just preference. When you're talking about fire, when we're talking about 26, you have people that aren't using it at all that are like, we don't need it. I had a call from somebody who said, we don't need fire. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like, really? <laughs> like, really, like legit? And I, I don't agree with that because I think that when you need it, you want it to be there. So it's, it, the, it's they the don't illusion. need it until they do. It's an illusion oh, of yeah. discretionary. It's not really discretionary. It's not. It's not. So that's my, yeah. Sure. Would, but Matt, what you're asking to do is for 2023, use your fund balance and the extra 9%. nine and then 2024, we go to go to a referendum and add it to the levy. Is that what I'm describing? Essentially, yeah. It, the 2023 is the stopgap so we can discontinue the brownouts and keep the station open uh, and start working on those response times while we spend a lot of time figuring out the best way to do 2024 uh, and beyond um, and whatever routes those be, whether it be a fee or whether it be on the tax base or, or whatever. And ultimately, the way the current formula exists, each community can do it however they see fit. I know five of the communities are not going to go to referendum. They're exploring the fee option, and that's that's the route that they're choosing to go down. Um, the town of Delafield and the city of Delafield are, are discussing the referendum. I, I would ask that you um, converse with your counterparts west of here and, and discuss some of those pitfalls of the referendum and, and things of that nature, So, because they can tell them to you. The pitfalls of the Western Lakes referendum were <coughs> that it failed and then they passed along the charge regardless. And so they're faced with um, the will of the people saying, no, we don't want this increase. And them saying, okay, too bad, so sad, we're giving it to you anyway in a different form. I'm a supporter of the referendum um, and I'm happy to live with the consequences. Um, and I wouldn't do a roundabout to say, okay, I'm going to pass a fee even though the voters voted this down. Um, and I'm comfortable with that um, because, I, like I've always said, I have great faith in, in our electorate in the city. My only question is, uh, I guess, to Tom and, and whomever, um, if we were to go to referendum, would it be more if if the state legislature acts in 2023 to provide support which i think they will based on what i've heard from public statements from public individuals um, would it be better to have to put to ask for a levy increase or would it be better to put it in a fee if you're getting support from the state i know that depends on what kind of support you're getting from the state. Well, the, but it, the support from the state would reduce reduce the ask either way. If all of a sudden we get support from the state, we could reduce the fees lower than what we're showing here, or we could reduce the, you know, if the, if the electorate, if the, if the people approve, you know, a $1.6 million increase to the levy, and then the state comes along and says, we're going to give you $200,000 a year, and then we'd only use 1.4 of the 1.6 that the people approved, right? Okay. But once you levy at 1.6, you've got flexibility in that levy? Once you levy at 1.6, yeah. once you levy at 1.6, then... We, if we, yeah, if that's the language we put, are we obligated to levy at 1.6 no, even though the state comes in and says here's an no, extra 200,000. We're not and that happened with our current referendum we're you know we're approved at 257 in the right. first year we only used 190. So then so then a fire fee or a levy increase is from that perspective I I think I'm understanding doesn't make a difference. Doesn't make a difference. Where would it make a difference? Well, I, me personally, I, I'm thinking people may likely be more willing to approve a few hundred dollars a year versus $1.6 million increase. Hmm. 
it, and it might be more logical to do the, the bigger, you know, levy, but I think you're right. The math is easier to swallow when the numbers are so big. I, yeah. <laughs> It's like an insurance. I, mm -hmm. Am I willing to pay three hundred and sixty bucks or five hundred bucks for this peace of mind? Seven twenty-four, three sixty-five. Well, sure. That's exactly how people responded. Why to not? That. Yeah, that's that's a no-brainer. I think the it looks like a good value. But you know, and they understand the numbers. They'll understand those numbers better. Uh, and, I do the math. My, I always do the math. I, yeah. I trust. My neighbors are going to do the math. You know, hey, leather seats are only an extra sixty bucks a month. It's like, well, uh, that's that's eleven grand. I mean, people do the math, so it's like we don't have to spoon yeah, feed them. Just, I just I the number's the number. It's it's one point six million bucks over four years. They're not going to know what their piece is. They advertise. They're not going to know what hundred grand on marketing, saying, "Hey, this is an extra cup of coffee." Or what? What was it? Don't do yeah, that. Don't do that. Yeah. What does one point six don't million dollars mean to me? I don't know what my share of that is when you present it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't yeah, know that there's be, I mean, how many that's, rooftops that's, are. That would be part of our as we're. I mean, we did that with the last re referendum. It, we broke it down and explained what would that be for you, and we would do the same thing. I mean, it would break it down as this is what it's going to look like per person or per. I mean, we, it. it it's a horse apiece. It doesn't, yeah, I mean well, that's a, this, that's part of our budget discussion, that. right? I mean, we're digesting the numbers that we have to face. Yeah, I mean that's and, part of well, the. Well, this is, we need a vehicle this, right now. This is a separate path compared to our 2023 budget because we're talking about 2024. We've got a short time frame. You know, I talk about January 16th, but really, you know, with the holidays and whatnot in there, we better have that question pretty well nailed down. You know, mid to late December. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as far as the path, I think the council needs to make a decision on whether we want to try to fund um, the proposed staffing plan. And if so, do we want to do that through a referendum? And if so, do we want to do it through a fee or a tax levy increase? And what information do you need that you don't have to get there? Something this big, I think we've got to go to referendum. If we're, you know, I'm, I'm used to fiery discussions over a five or ten percent budget increase. It's a hundred and fifty percent increase. If if we did this behind, you know, if we did this and didn't go to referendum, I'd be sitting there yelling at us. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, though, that you have to also realize, and I think that's why these other cities who had the referendum and failed. And then they pass it anyways. I think you have a legal obligation as a city to provide safety services to the to the public. If we don't do this, we're not providing the safety services that we were elected to provide. Unlike most of our referendums, you know, you put up a library, stuff like that. There are voluntary things that you didn't really have to do, but we have to provide police and fire protection. You, so still, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you true. don't. You're still providing them. You're just not providing them up to the city's, the residents' expectations. You've got an 11 or, or they'll tell you what you're doing is okay. Right. Right. That's yeah. a decision. It's a 12-minute response time versus an 8-minute response that's time. That's their choice. And it may be growing. Unless, unless they're the one making the call. I, I, I don't think... Um, if it were someone that I cared about, that it would be no big deal to make it fifty percent longer. You know, um, yeah. and it becomes more complicated too when we're not in this by ourselves and we're in it. We've got you know, basically teammates and uh, with regards to municipalities that we're in this with, and um, some of them are more affected by the brownouts than than others, and. Do we know what their plans are as far as, I mean, are they, are the other communities looking at, f you know, four, five years out as well, or are they looking at it like we're fixing it now? I mean, are, are we consistent with how they're approaching it? I think they all know the number. They're all coming up with their own ways to get there. Right, but if we, if we approve it on a four-year increase and 
they approve it, oh, we're doing it 100%. I mean, it goes to, all right, we've only approved a quarter of it. So is that where we're at? Or would we increase it over the four years? Because that's what we, I mean, that's what I just, if we're a approving a plan that's completely different than somebody else's plan, how do we decide over four years or however many, how does that work out that, uh, get, one, how does one, it get implemented? One way or another, you don't want to be going referendum every single year. Because, no, I mean, no, no, I'm not saying that, but I'm, I'm just saying if we, okay, so let's say we agree to this for on, on here, this, this fee where, we're, okay, we're going to go with the next, the rooftop approach next year, we're approving 532 and the year after that we're approving, you know, we're approving this increase over the next four years. Okay, next year we're only approving 532 per rooftop. If if somebody, if another community is saying, okay, we're approving the whole amount, are they going to stretch it out over the four years because that's what we agreed to? Or is it, do you understand how do you, how do you merge those plans together? Like, it, does it come to, it becomes our plan because we're the so lowest no, of the... All seven communities know the four steps that are involved and what the cost of each step is. Okay, so they're all And on if the, one community okay. doesn't take the step, then everybody reverts back. Okay, so nobody is trying to fix this in one year. Everybody's planning on doing this over four years? Correct. Okay, there, that, that's what I was asking. Yeah, <laughs> there are some communities that desire to take the step next year um, okay. and, and fix it entirely. However, I think as a compromise, they understand the magnitude of the ask, and they um, are compromising with the four-year plan. Okay, I just want to make sure we're all kind of on the same page as that. Like yeah. that we're... We, we don't we don't pass four-year budgets. I mean, the the no. fire budget's got to come to us every year. We're just figuring out how to come up with the money. Right. So we could come up with the money and maybe not spend it. But, but we if we do a referendum, that. it's going to be a four-year referendum. Well, this, like, this is how it's going to implement. This did start out in, in July or August as a $6 million okay. referendum to make the complete change next year. Which I don't... It's where it started. Yeah, I, I think that would be hard <laughs> to, to get through. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, in my opinion, I see this going to referendum over with with... The intent that it would increase over the four years, and that would be built into the referendum. One I, referendum approves I mean, the four-year plan. Now yeah, the referendum would yeah. approve the four-year plan. That's that's, that's, that's right. the vision. That's easy to do with the fire fee. We can list the fire fee for each of the three years. It would be that's difficult to do with the levy limit because what do you do? Do you get the ultimate amount approved, and then do you just educate the people and tell them that? Until we get to 2026, we'll be spending less than the ultimate amount. And even after the after 2026, the fire department's budget is going to keep going up. Right. But hopefully, at that point, they could. Well, if it's. I mean, at, at that point, they'd have to stick to within CPI plus two percent, and they should be able to do so once they're up to the proper staffing. And if they're within CPI plus two percent, then the levy can accommodate their increase. Okay. So at the budget meeting in two weeks, we should yeah. come prepared <laughs> to discuss which way we want to go. Yeah, which way we want to go with regards to, do we want to fund the ultimate staffing plan? If so, do we have to go to referendum? Now I'll have these for, as action items. Uh, and uh, if we go to referendum, is it for a levy limit increase or a fee increase? And um, and if any of this math gets tweaked by the fire board, we'll need the updated numbers. Fire board's not meeting until they're meeting the this Thursday at five p.m. No, but that's not when they're approving budgets for future years. Correct. We've called a special meeting for November 10th um, where we're going to discuss the only thing on the agenda is to discuss the, the out years, the 2024 and beyond. So then we can get those statistics to you uh, and financial figures to you before your December time frame where you need to do that. Yeah, and I'll, so I'll just say that, I mean, I think I could speak for the other municipalities again, and the, the rest of them are really strongly considering the fee for the exact reasons that you brought up, Tom, where it allows you to to do the you know 24, 25, and 26 plan where the fee is this here and, and you move forward. 
Whereas the levy limit thing, that if we, if we see a failure point west of here, it's that it was all in one, and it it uh, it needs to be phased in over time. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, is there any more information that that the council needs to make those three decisions? Okay, we'll have that on the next agenda. And then if the budget numbers do get tweaked, we would know those numbers for the second meeting in November. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we are on to number 11, Mayor's Report A. Discussion and possible action on the following items. One, accept resignation of Courtney Grazanio from the Library Board. I will so move. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions passes. <clears throat> Item number two, confirm appointment of Ken Beckman to the citizen member position on the Library Board vacated by Courtney. So moved. Term to expire 2025. So moved. I'll second. Who had the second? Paul. Paul. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes? Okay, new business. Approval of vouchers. Payable report for the following <coughs> reported dates. I did want to just point out a couple of things with this. So we were a little bit behind on the reports. They're all caught up now. Also with the reports, we have started to include some things that weren't included. So you'll see an increase in the pricing in the amount, and that's because we included some of those transmittals that were part of payroll that were not being included before. We weren't sure why that was the case. Um, we felt transparency was um, necessary for that. So that did increase the overall amounts by a little bit on, on those voucher sheets. Other than that. Thank you. Somebody want to give me a motion? Move to approve the vouchers for uh, August through September. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention passes. City Administrator. I'll move to approve the Do we need three different ones? Oh, I thought you did all um, three months. Can I do that? I thought you did. Yeah, you Is did. that what you did? You make a motion to approve one, two, and three. I'll make a motion to approve two and three now. I'll second two and three. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions two and three are also passed. Uh, report of city officials, city administrator, one reminder regarding the budget workshop, Tuesday, November 1st, 2022, at 6 p.m. If it's not in your calendar, please add it. Anything else, Tom? Nope. Can just okay, give my update. You want to remind people if they want to attend? It's open to the public. Oh, right? sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So it's uh, at the... Uh, is it at, is it I believe it's going to be a public safety building again, but check the agenda to be sure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, B City Clerk. Um, election is coming up less than a month away. Uh, we go to Heritage tomorrow, and then the following Tuesday, in person absentee starts on October 25th. Uh, we will have uh, poll workers helping us with that. I do expect some pretty high volume. Um, other than that, I think that's all I have for the election. Um, staffing, we have officially hired um, two folks for our vacant positions. One of them started today. Her name is Jennifer Townsend. She took over the administrative support assistant position. Um, and then starting on October 31st, we have um, Crystal Turner in the deputy clerk position. She is not coming with... Um, any municipal experience, but I feel uh, very confident that she has plenty of uh, experience. She is a uh, store, currently a store manager for the uh, Johnson Creek Coles location and has been for quite some time. So I think that her capability to learn and her eagerness to take in the position is going to be a really good um, fit for the city of Delafield. I don't know if Tom was in on the interview for her. I don't know if he has anything to add. Yeah, I would just say that she has extensive experience in uh, HR areas and payroll areas, which are two of the primary functions that our deputy clerk serves for the city. Great. Sounds good. All right. Uh, see you, city treasurer. Refer you to the refer you to the packet D council request for future agenda items. 
Going once, going twice, gone. 14, I'll refer you to correspondence. Seeing no further business, we are now adjourned at 9.59. Thank you. <laughs>